Hello and welcome. I hope you're doing well. Come and get cozy as I share with you some absolutely terrifying encounters. I post new videos every day, so be sure to hit that subscribe button and the notification bell, and you'll be notified when new daily content arrives on my channel. All right, let's get right into it. In Calaveras County in California, near Bear Valley, as a new high school graduate, I planned a camping trip to an area near a Boy Scout camp, Wolfboro, with my new girlfriend, as an Eagle Scout and an athlete, I was recruited to play football at California. I wanted to impress my friend who loved the outdoors. The destination was around a dammed watershed called Bicer's Reservoir. There was a dirt logging road turn off Highway 4 between Bear Valley and Angel's Camp. We drove down this windy dirt road some 7 to 15 miles crossing over a little bridge that crossed a very shallow Danilaus River, since it was very hot during the summer month. Until we reached the end of the road at the dam, we packed about a mile down the river, Greenwater River, that ran out the bottom of the dam. Only one side of the river had a hiking trail. The other side of the river was very steep and rocky with boulders on the bank. This was in the middle of the week, and I knew from my scouting and other trips that very few people were seen in this area. I was setting up my camp at a clearing next to the river and my girlfriend was fishing. It was hot as she had a tangled line while wading in the stream. She yelled up to me that she saw somebody crossing the river above us some distance from the other side of the river, effectively to warn me not to be surprised if they walked past on the trail. Nobody came down the trail, and we forgot the incident. An uneventful evening passed. The next day, we decided to break camp and go back to the Stanilaus. Maybe there was better fishing. This obviously required us to backpack to the car and drive a few miles to the little bridge crossing the Stanilaus River. We parked next to the bridge and found what looked like a fishing trail. We packed along the trail, if you could call it that, until it was too difficult to hike. There was a lot of little pines close together, and there were bigger and bigger granite boulders in our way. We found a clearing some 20 yards from the river. I pitched the tent next to a dried creek bed. The creek bed was a few feet wide, and the tent was a dozen feet from it. The rear of the tent was a few feet from a slope consisting of huge boulders and small pines. We made a campfire when evening fell. It was a clear, moonlit night, except for the thunder we heard in the distance. I remember that there could be these rogue thunderclouds. Anyway, later in the evening, when we were about to turn in, we heard strong screams coming from the upstream direction. This was in the direction where we ran out of the hiking trail. The screams occurred periodically for half an hour to an hour. I rationalized them to be a thick, or injured range cow. During my scouting days, I was told that cattle roaming the area and the snow level would effectively herd themselves down the river valley. We went to bed, and I must have only been asleep for a couple of hours when the thunderclouds were close enough to wake us. I wanted to put some things, like my shoes, in the tent so they wouldn't get soaked from the rain. Once back in my sleeping bag, I stayed awake listening. When I heard two footsteps behind us on the rocks of the dry creek bed. I listened more intently and I heard two more steps than a pause. I was really scared, especially since we had seen the movie Friday the 13th the week before. I had thought it was a person stalking us. I attempted to peer out the back mesh window of the tent. Nothing was said between me and my friends and I didn't want to alarm her, even though I was scared stiff. What I did see was a large silhouette standing and then moving two steps at a time past the tree in that dried creek bed. After what seemed like a long time, the thing moved or walked deliberately past our tent toward the river. The front part of the tent faced the river and was zipped closed. But this thing that I believed was a Bigfoot 
started splashing and making that strong, high-pitched screaming noise at the river. I then heard footsteps come directly toward our tent and stop right in front of the tent. My hand was on my buck knife. Then I heard it run away. I think after a while, we might have said something like, Did you hear that? Let's get out of here. Daybreak was only a short time off, and we waited for the first sign of light. We hastily packed up camp and drove home. We talked about maybe checking in with the ranger, but we didn't. We eventually tied the fisherman crossing the river the day before below the dam to maybe not being a human but a Bigfoot. The so-called fisherman crossing the river was dressed in very dark clothing, my girlfriend said. That seemed odd since it was so hot. A friend of mine with a mother that sold real estate in the Angel Camp area had heard that some of his buddies driving their Jeep on the logging roads had sighted what they thought was a Bigfoot. On to the next one. My husband Jim and I were on our long-anticipated vacation, which was a combination of sightseeing and house hunting. We were both born and raised in the Chicagoland area. When this incident occurred, we were living in Morton Grove. For anyone who knows this city, you can understand that this is not the place to enjoy outdoor recreation which Jim and I had our heart set on since we married a year ago. Jim and I were having dinner at our favorite restaurant when he handed me a street map and asked me what area of the city I'd like to live in. Opening the map, the first thing I noticed was the name Rapid City, South Dakota. I was baffled, too much to speak, and Jim finally told me he had an offer on the table to run his company's new sporting goods store that was currently being built in Rapid City. He then asked me if I would like to live in South Dakota. I think I must have taken all of 10 seconds to say yes, as even Jim was shocked by my quick response. There was no doubt in my mind that I would rather raise a family in anywhere other than the heart of a big city. Two weeks later, we drove to Rapid City on a house hunting expedition and we planned a lot of sightseeing with it. Jim had never been out of the city, but I had accompanied my parents on many South Dakota vacations from my birthplace in Waterloo, Iowa, so I acted as a tour guide of sorts. We had reservations in a nice motel paid for by Jim's employer, and they were also picking up the tab for meals and mileage allowance for using our own car. Jim told me that his boss had really been anxious for him to accept the promotion, so they wanted us to fall in love with the place. Before meeting with our selected real estate people, we took time to drive all over the city to get a feel for the place. Then, on our fourth day, we began looking at homes for sale. After three days of home searches, we needed a break, so we headed out through what the locals called some badlands and ended up on the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation. After driving through this eyesore, I felt genuinely ashamed of what our government had done to these once proud people. That reservation is a horror. We quickly left that horrible place that simply reeked of shame. As we were cutting across country toward a shortcut back to Rapid City, we were making good time when Jim suddenly slammed on the brake, backed up a ways, and turned down a barely discernible set of rutted tracks grown over with several inches of grass. He said he had spotted what looked to be an old cemetery out of the corner of his eye, and after a couple of minutes on this overgrown trail, the car lurched as we bounced over an ancient fence post that had become invisible where it had long ago fallen across the road. A minute later, we arrived at a wide area, once a parking lot, and now just a flat, weed-infested place to park, which we quickly did. I still had not seen what had precipitated this detour, but I followed Jim's lead as he set out along the ancient line of rotting fence posts. Curving around an ancient oak tree, Jim suddenly stopped and stared slightly downward, 
and as I stood alongside him, I could see before me what was plainly an old cemetery. We walked down the gentle slope, and once on the level, the main cemetery was apparently better maintained than first appearances indicated. Every grave, although not lavishly decorated, showed signs of upkeep, and few weeds or grasses appeared anywhere. There were no lawns, as obviously there was no indication of water lines this far in the country. There was a small shed at the far end of the graveyard that sat among a short group of pine trees that we assumed held maintenance equipment. This entire property had a mysterious air about it, and we were hit with the realization that it was also strangely unlike the cemeteries we were familiar with because there were no signs, no gravestones, or absolutely no identification markers indicating who was buried here. We already had figured out that this was a long-neglected Native American burial ground patterned after the white man cemeteries. While there must have been some record kept of the occupants of these carefully manicured spaces, there were no individual markers. In order to pay one's respects, a person would have to be privileged to know exactly where the party thought was resting before coming here. I was about to mention this oddity to Jim when I noticed he had wandered out to a knoll that was detached from the plot where I was, and it was separated from the main grouping by a wildflower-covered lower area, yet connected by a carefully marked pathway along which there were painted stones lining both sides of the narrow gravel walk. As I made my way toward my husband, I noticed him squatting before a fairly large burial site that was boarded by a sort of fence consisting of a combination of larger rocks and short sections of railroad ties, and they were staggered like this all around the grave, making a fairly large oval shape. As I approached quietly, out of respect, Jim heard me coming and rose to his feet while putting something in his pocket. He noticed my having seen it and he casually said, pretty rough from the pathway. I know he said that to assure me that it wasn't breaking the caution that we had read about removing anything from a native grave, which would carry a deadly curse. I dismissed the incident as I knew how Jim felt about that superstition because he reminded me before we first arrived at the cemetery how his maternal grandfather had supposedly stolen a valuable gemstone from a Sioux chief's gravesite while on vacation. And his mother had told us that her father had died a horrible death while wearing his stolen necklace with the gem on it. Having Jim's mother tell the story left little doubt in my mind that she truly believed that her father had died as a direct result of that graveyard theft. Although, when away from her presence, Jim poo-pooed the curse idea, her father had evidently had the stone attached to a sterling silver necklace of considerable strength because she told us her dad had gone to work wearing his trophy and as he was on a construction crew for the railroad, he was reaching up to grab a bucket of creosote to hand down to the man on the scaffold below him when he slipped on the planking and lost his footing. His mother was so graphic in her telling of the story that Jim and I never forgot it. As she said, the bucket slipped from his hand while still above his head, and as it fell past his head, he ducked, but the hook on the handle caught his trophy necklace, and the weight of it caused the strong necklace wire to cut his head clean off. I had been there at her house when she finally told Jim that story after so many years. She had said she felt he should know, because back then we were planning to honeymoon in the Dakotas, which coincidentally had been where the accident took place. Such a gruesome story for our honeymoon, but his mom said she couldn't hold back the truth anymore, and she felt she owed it to him to know how his grandfather had died. So now, my mind returned to that story, and I had such a jolt to my senses, I had to ask Jim assured me that it was just a colored agate that had no real value. He said it was only near the grave, and from a place so close to what must certainly have been an important man, it would have to bring us good luck. Anyway, 
the incident was soon forgotten, and we spent the next couple of days seeing sights, taking photos, and enjoying the beautiful area. Then back to reality. We toured more homes, and to our amazement, we both agreed on a newly built home in a beautifully scenic subdivision that was like a painting with the forests and hills all around. Two days later, the papers were signed and the final papers were to be signed at our title company in Morton Grove, and we would own our new home in Rapid City. That fact and a 20-year mortgage made us owners. It was time to totally relax for a few days, and the first thing the next morning, Jim surprised me with a trip to a jewelry store. Jim knew that I had desired a specific type of bangle bracelet, and when we walked in the store, I saw exactly what I wanted. While I was being measured for sizing, Jim was busy in the other end of the store. When I was finished, we set a time for pickup the next day, and when I asked Jim what he'd been doing, his answer was just, you'll see. The next day, we picked up my bracelet, and Jim again went over to see the same person he had been with the day before, and as we were walking toward the car, I asked what he was so secretive about. It was then that Jim admitted to telling me a little white lie, and he pulled up his jacket sleeve, and there was his own bracelet. Jim had sort of hinted that he had always wanted an ID bracelet before we first entered the store, and when I told him to buy one, we had pretty much agreed that we would, but he said he wanted to surprise me with what he was thinking. I had certainly gone along with that, and now it was time to find out what he had been so secretive about. Rather than a gold link bracelet that I expected to see, here was a chain link bracelet of sterling silver. The links were heavy and thick, but there was something more. As he turned the bracelet over, there was a large, bread-winged eagle attached over the links. The eagle appeared to have been beautifully and intricately hand-carved. I was really surprised at the beauty of the piece, and although I was taken aback by my husband's total departure from his usual persona, I made the assumption that his personality was maybe becoming more fit to his new role as a manager of a beautiful new store. No more was said until dinner that evening, as I must have been unconsciously displaying my new bracelet as I noticed Jim's eyes being continually drawn to it. He kept his new prize fairly well hidden, which was more in keeping with his reserved personality, while I flaunted mine. We spent a few more days visiting furniture stores and familiarizing ourselves with the city, visiting their famous reptile gardens and bear country, and then we headed back to the motel to pack up. As I packed up our bags, as was my habit, I was gathering up receipts and making records of expenditures. I smiled when adding our jewelry receipts to the envelope when I noticed a notion on Jim's receipt that had two pieces, one for the bracelet and a separate charge that said, Attach Customer Silver Eagle. As soon as Jim returned from putting our suitcases in the car, I asked him where he got the eagle because I was becoming fearful of what I now suspected he may have done. Then, knowing that there had never been a colorful rock, he confessed to having taken it off the Native American's grave. I was shocked that he had seen it fit to lie to me, but he begged my forgiveness and said he planned to someday admit to it, but that he just knew the minute he thought that it would bring us luck. I was so sick to my stomach, out of both betrayal and genuine fear that we hardly spoke for two days, as I kept the sound system up while Jim drove fast toward home. Once we returned home, things were soon back to normal, and we kept a close eye on monitoring the progress of Jim's new store. Finally, we had closed on the new house, given adequate notice on our rental home, and within three weeks, we headed to Rapid City once more only this time for good. After a few nights in the motel, our movers brought our furniture and we spent the next several days buying appliances and accessories that better fit our new home. Then we found ourselves having a beer on our new patio and awaiting the grand opening of Jim's beautiful new sporting goods store. That next Saturday, 
Jim headed down to make a final inspection of the store, and then we planned to go out to dinner that evening. When I hadn't heard from Jim, and the afternoon was almost into dusk, I began to worry. Calling a cell phone, I was surprised to hear a strange answer. It was a nurse at the local hospital, and she was quick to tell me that Jim was okay, but he had hurt himself, and they were stitching him up, and he would be in the recovery room in about an hour. Since we had not yet bought a car for me, I took a cab to the store and retrieved his car, and with my set of Jim's car keys, I drove to the hospital, arriving just as Jim was being wheeled into recovery. I sat by him until he awoke. It turned out that he had been testing the metal warehouse door when the latch cover on its way up caught on Jim's new bracelet and completely ripped off his last two fingers along with the bracelet. The door had fortunately triggered the safety shutoff or he could have lost his life as he was the only one there. Just before he passed out, Jim was able to call 911. The doctor said he had been able to reattach the fingers and partial tendons, but he explained that Jim would never recover full use of those fingers and only part of the function of his hand. Well, we made it through the grand opening, and two weeks later, we found ourselves with me behind the wheel returning to a familiar spot with absolutely no resistance from my repentant husband. We followed our previous route until we arrived at the place where it all began. Jim knelt down and laid the silver eagle, his bracelet included, on the grave of the Native American from where he had previously borrowed it, and he uttered a profuse apology, after which we departed for home. Suddenly, what had been an overcast and dreary day cleared up, and in a few minutes, the blue sky was surrounding us. Jim just looked at me and smiled. Then he glanced over again and said, Don't tell mom. I hope you enjoyed those encounters. And if you did, be sure to hit that like button, leave a comment, and subscribe. I post new content every single day. So be sure to hit that notification bell and you'll be notified exactly when that new content arrives on my channel. Again, thank you so much, and until next time, bye!